This is Coda Radio, episode 419 for June 23rd, 2021. Hey, good look and welcome into Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show, taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and the world of technology. This episode is brought to you by a cloud guru. A cloud guru has the cloud playground, Azure, AWS, and Google Cloud on their sandboxes and credit card, not yours. Get certified, get hired, get learning at a cloudguru.com. My name is Chris and battling technical issues so he can podcast. It's our host, Mr. Dominic. Hello, Mike. Hello. Man, what a week, right? Like, I'm losing my voice. You're fighting tech demons. Oh, yeah. It's not even the half of it. That's just the last 15 minutes. <laughs> this was, like, crazy. The M1 failed me. Yeah, so uh, what ter- what started out as a as a as just a quick journey to install a program to capture audio from an audio device turned into you, like, booting into recovery environments? <laughs> what happened? Well, first of all, I guess we have to do a little inside baseball for Mac here. Popular at PH, so made by Rogue Amoeba. Uh, that was a tongue twister. Requires a kernel extension to directly record audio because many, many things in macOS require kernel extensions that you might not think should. So, you know, that used to be just a matter of going into security preferences and enabling it. Now you have to reboot into a recovery mode, enable it there. It took a total of four reboots to get this work working, and it blew away my desktop settings, all my files organized, and my background. No. Yep. God knows what's going to happen after the show when I decide to try to use, you know, any of like the Linuxy, Unixy stuff in Homebrew. Like, you think it just it like reset the uh, PRAM or whatever the hell they call it? It reset something. Wow, that that sucks. And and imagine a. A typical user who maybe doesn't even know what a kernel extension is, is trying to install this software and gets a prompt, hey, you got to reboot and go into a recovery environment. And then when you booted back up, it was blocked initially. It was blocked. Yeah. So and it kept having to reboot to unblock it. It's just too much protection. They're turning it into an iPhone. Ooh, that's a bold statement. I think they are. Well, you know, <laughs> Phil Schiller did say on the stand in the Epic trial that he they consider the openness and uh I think security vulnerabilities are um, on Mac OS to be unacceptable. Sounds like they're right on their way of solving it and working out Rogue Amoeba, which Rogue Amoeba is one of the best software creators uh, on the desktop for any platform. I mean, they just make incredible software uh, in the audio realm. I respect that a lot. And uh, if I were ever going to have a Mac, I would have the Rogue Amoeba apps on there. They'd have to work. I'd have to go through all of that, I guess. (laughs) What a... What a pain in the neck. Um, Wait a minute. Now my desktop background is just, hold on, real-time update. It's just the color blue. Yet on the other workspace, it's the default whatever for whatever version of Mac. I think I'm on Mojave or something. Doesn't really generally manifest itself, but my previous experience with Mac OS when I was doing Hackintoshes is it felt like a bit of a house of cards and you pull out one thing and a surprising amount of things just quit working. Yeah. You know, they've built it for a very specific, very defined environment and situation. Something's super not right here. Oh, well, we, we can move on. You're going to have fun after the show. Yeah, this is this is wrong. Unrelated to this, you also picked yourself up a new Thaleo. I'm extremely jealous because I've been wanting one so bad, but I just can't get over the GPU prices right now. Yeah, the GPU prices are nuts. I didn't go super hard on the GPU, but um, yeah, I don't have it yet, though. I guess production is taking a bit longer than I thought it would. So I will let you know once I have it. You're a unique individual in that I can ask, on average... On average, when you buy a Thaleo mic, how often does it take to ship? (laughs) Because I've never bought one and you've bought several. (laughs) Well, that's true because I do those contests. It's always the Thaleo as a prize. Um, Usually a couple business days. Whoa, that's way faster than I expected. Yeah, I think it depends on what configs. I noticed that the lower end ones tend to ship faster. Oh, sure. Maybe they have the parts in stock already and stuff. Well, maybe I also wonder if they don't like pre- you know what I mean? Like pre-configure a bunch of those because probably their highest seller. Yeah. And they're not a huge cost. Because I did go up to the 12 gig NVIDIA GPU in this one. So I think when the GPU prices come back down, I'm going to be really tempted. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, well I'll, well, I'll do my decibel readings on it. So that's my, that's my, you know how I am about the background noise. Yeah, I'll, I'll be really interested to know how that is, how that stacks up now. 
Well, I'm going to be out at System 76 in August. I'm looking forward to that. I'm heading out to Denver and also Salt Lake City. We're going to do meetups at both locations, August 7th in Salt Lake City and August 20th in Denver. We'll we'll have all the details at meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. And if you're interested in going to a Denver meetup or a Salt Lake City meetup, please do. And our friends at Linode are on board with this trip. And not only are they making the trip possible, but they're going to help us produce uh, some exclusive content during the road trip that will feature team interviews, the people we go and see. Uh, I'm hoping to uh, to get a little bit of the inside story on the creation of the launch keyboard while we're there. And we'll have an episode on that as well. And I'll do a few coders live from the road. So if you're a Coder Radio uh, audience member in those areas... Or, not, or if you can make it there, come see us. Uh, again, August 7th, Salt Lake City, August 20th in Denver, meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. I'm really looking forward to it. It's been a long time. And the last event I went to really stunk. It was like almost two years ago, and I regretted going to it while I was there. Mm-hmm. Gave me just this horrible, horrible feeling about the future of cybersecurity. And uh, then that was it. <laughs> then it was lockdown time. <sighs> So, yeah, it's going to be great to see people. And uh, I'm getting the RV ready right now, which is not in great shape because my slide's broken and all that. But uh, working on that at the moment to try to get it ready. And then we're going to load up and we're going to do a meetup in Denver. Of course, Mr. Dominic, you are welcome as well. Um, Everybody's welcome. Everybody. I know not everybody can because everybody's got jobs and stuff they got to do. But we're opening it up to everybody who might be able to make it out. You you know what? You know, I love System 76. The problem is if I show up in Denver... Do I have to bring an extra carry-on for another Thaleo? A few launch keyboards under my shirt? Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's why I think some of us are going to drive so we can just load up our trunks. You know? <laughs> drive from Florida. I think you can't even imagine how far that is. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Oof. Um, hey, guess what I have right here? I have a box. What's in the box? Let's see. Stand by, sir. I'm going to open it up right now here on the show. It is, it's a big box too. It's heavy and it's a box filled with dun 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 dun, the coder robes. I got a whole batch of them right here. That's yep. Right. Oh, I got yeah. mine yesterday. Oh, did you? Yes, yes, I did. I wore, I took it. I put a picture on Twitter. <laughs> I didn't see it. I, 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 I failed in my stocking. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 man. Turned out great. Turned out great. Oh, look at that. I got a whole batch of them here. Once for Wes. Going to give him a coder. So when you saw people were sending in their coder rope pictures. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I love that. People should keep doing that. They're not all done yet. So if you haven't got your coder yet, there is probably going to be another several week delay. I apologize. But then the next batch and probably the final batch will ship. And it really is just down to supplies. We've had, we've had a lot of people ask us to do another run. I will consider it when the whole global supply shortage is over. You, you didn't have fun. Oh my gosh. And the thread on this is particular too. So it just took them forever. And so maybe in the fall, I don't know, but boy, did it turn out, huh? It's great. Woo wee! It really is. Coder. Yep. One size fits all Tolly with pockets. Classic. You can wear it. It's an all day wear. It's the coder. I'm really happy with that. I'm very, very pleased. It was, it was nice. It was nice to see that go out. God damn it. It blew away my Xcode tool chain too. No way, man. How can this happen? All the command line tools are gone. It reset my terminal. What did it revert? Did it revert to some image? I think it revert reverted all the utility stuff to base settings. Yeah, it's I typed git and it's literally trying to install git. Told it's telling me to run Xcode select. It, it's if it, it sounds like it reverted back to because you know the, the system partition and stuff's read only. Sounds like it reverted back or something. So it just wiped out everything but user land? Yeah, sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah, obviously. That explain the settings being weird, too. Wow. Huh, and it deleted the directory under photos, under pictures, with all my custom backgrounds. What the hell? And it's the same user account, right? Yeah, I only have one user account on this machine. Do you know it's not crazy and unreliable, though? What's that? The coder. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It finally, it's just slow. <laughs> It's just real slow. It's just slow. But uh, a lot of people wrote in and said that they that the material is higher than higher quality than they expected and it was worth the wait. And that's what I wanted to hear. Chuck wants your reaction, maybe my reaction too, to this. Uh, he writes in, he says, guys, Sir Tim Berners-Lee is launching an NFT for the original Objective-C source code he used to create the World Wide Web. Yes. I'd love to know your thoughts on this. What do you think? It's Objective-C. 
I love it. Honestly, if you had the money, would you buy it? Absolutely. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I also hate this, by the way. I do hate this. I hate this deeply. I hate I hate Adam Yeah. 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 But <laughs> that said, like if Linus Torvalds wanted to make an NFT out of his original Linux commit or something. How about an NFT of him throwing in video of the finger? Yeah. I don't know. I think these, I'd actually just rather have a printed version with him, with his signature on it than an NFT though. <laughs> just, just, I don't know. Knowing you would have to be on like a nice canvas made only of the finest. Uh... <laughs> right. That'd be great with a, a sapphire glass uh, frame. <laughs> Jeez, man. I just don't like where this is going. Um, where does it end? I wonder. And it's not like it's the only copy. I hear people that try to make the art analogy, but I have a hard time with it. And I'm not, I'm not really Mr. Anti-Crypto uh, coin and stuff. I, I think uh, Bitcoin gets a bad rap. I don't. I think people that give Bitcoin a hard time for its environmental impact haven't done any research and don't know what they're talking about. And they couldn't tell you the environmental impact of everybody switching to electric cars and charging Teslas in their homes. And if that takes any more power than a Bitcoin, nobody knows. And so I think Bitcoin gets a hard rap. I'm not anti any of this kind of stuff. I think it's worth exploring. But something about this NFT stuff where you're selling um, something that you can make endless copies of doesn't feel like um, legitimate and fair to the purchaser. It's weird because you just described like the people who say they shouldn't have to pay for software. Right. <laughs> well, you just made their argument. Like, it's true. It's true. Well, a topic that Jimmy wanted to write in on uh, is touching on our Linux dying as a desktop OS conversation. He says, my dearest sexy coder host, as someone who's run Linux since the late 90s, this has been something on my mind for the last five years or so. It seems to me, even as much as Linux has caught up to the other big OSs in terms of functionality and applications, we're now back in the same place we were about 20 years ago. By this, I mean the mobile and their general ecosystems. Even with really cool projects like KDE Connect and where KDE and GNOME are taking their desktops, we're still over a decade behind. We're not even playing the same game, let alone the ballpark. When you're in your 30s with kids, with things in your house like tablets, TVs, and cars, and lady tubes all connected and syncing, not even to mention an ever-growing connected outside world, well, Linux can sometimes feel like a bit of a hindrance, something that needs to be tweaked constantly to get some of the basic features I've mentioned even half working. Not only is that annoying, but then when you're busy and you just want things to work, it's going to be more of an issue. And we also have the problem that more and more of us, as time goes on, will start to use our phones for payments door access, and even ID cards. Linux is out on all of that. Take that along with Windows now getting better for developers than ever, Apple doing their thing, and automation with servers in the cloud, serverless, and containerization. It's hard to see how Linux is going to stay relevant for most people going into the future. Only a niche few who are working on the core technology behind the scenes and being paid by large corporations. Assuming Fuchsia doesn't get too popular. It makes me sad to think about this, but another way to look at it is look how far this little free and open source community and project actually went. From a small, nerdy project, often mocked for being only for hobbyists, to powering the entire internet and complete infrastructure of every large service billions of people rely on day to day. Hell, even Windows has it baked in now. Who would have imagined that in 2008 while tweaking their compass settings on Ubuntu Hardy Heron? Linux beat all others and ultimately won. So, if the day comes the next decade where I have to pour one out for my homie Tux, I'll do it with a smile, fond, and proud memories. I don't think you're ever going to be pouring one out for your homie Tux, though. I I agree. I mean, you still have you still have people that are using listening to records. <sighs> like I'm just saying, some stuff never dies. But this is going to have it's it's going to still it will. If, I think probably for as long as you and I draw breath, there will be Linux servers. And as long as there are large amounts of Linux servers, won't there always be devs and sysadmins who want to use what they're running on the server on their desktop for what they're maybe building for the server? Yeah, I would go even further. I think it's going to be as long as you and I draw breath and our grandkids draw breath. Yeah, it's it's one of those entrenched forever kind of technologies. And because of the licensing, they can just perpetually keep it going. So it's going to be one of those things that just keeps on going. Like, you, you know, they stretch out commercial operating systems. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> they just keep rolling, baby. Uh, and talk about this often because it often is perceived as an elitist attitude. But I actually don't don't even agree with the premise that if only 
nerds like developers and sysadmins and geeks use Linux, I don't I don't buy the premise that's a bad thing. I think the operating system is particularly good at catering to that those particular niches. And why not build a system that just super delivers to that user base while the commercial platforms focus on the mythical new user constantly? I think it's actually a very reasonable place for desktop Linux to land. And that doesn't mean that it needs to have you know, some cloud syncing service. It just means that it needs to work with whatever solution I, as a geek, build for myself. Yeah, I would even take it a step further that the mythical new user is probably going to increasingly be a tablet or a more likely phone user. Yeah, or maybe Chromebook, but yeah. Yeah, the Chromebook. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know it's big in education, but I'm, I've, you know I've never been on the Chromebook train. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. So one more on this topic, and then we'll move on. Tim writes in with a bulletproof Linux recipe. He says, I use an Intel NUC as my desktop and a Dell XPS as my laptop running Fedora. They both have integrated Intel graphics and nothing weird in them. And you know, they're always going to work. For gaming, I have an Xbox. For my wife, who isn't really into computers, she uses an iPad. I used to be really big into Windows and PC gaming, but honestly, Windows 10 wore me down. Operating systems that make decisions for me on my behalf, that's just a little bit too much for me, and I'm never going to go back. Say what you will, but staying on the rails and just not doing anything out of the ordinary is all it really takes to use desktop Linux. Upgrade only when you have time and maintain an Ansible playbook to make it easy. <laughs> I love that. Just all you got to do. <laughs> just learn Ansible. Uh, I said, but that's how you do survive. And you won't be tempted to use an operating system that needs an internet connection to search for a list of locally installed applications. Uh, I kind of agree with Tim to a degree, though. If your workload allows and you kind of just use Linux on Rails, like a like a System76 system or like my ThinkPad X1 Carbon that came with Fedora or the Dell XPS developer line, they are going to work every time you load Linux on that thing. And they work really, really reliably. Uh, but... That is a large user base, and it's it's a very viable customer base, but it also doesn't work for folks that maybe need to do machine learning, and they have to push their, their video driver forward and their kernel driver forward, or people that are doing media production. It also doesn't work for people that are doing development that targets upcoming Linux platforms, like maybe the next version of RHEL. They, they, they can't really ride those rails like ever. So there are, there are use cases where you need to use Linux, but it, you can't necessarily use it on rails like Tim suggests, but... He makes a good point, I thought. Are you suggesting the Macification of Linux? In a way, it is, right? That's I think the developer line, the XPS developer line, feels the most like that, in my opinion. Right, yeah, well, and then some of the stuff uh, you mentioned, System76, that's kind of their whole pitch, right? They're, they made a big push, at least last year. Yeah, and I think with Pop, in a way, they are, they're kind of building that, but more oriented at power users. Because Pop doesn't feel like they're watering it down. They're doing tiling window manager and keyboard combinations and... Right. With Pop, they assume you know what you're doing. With current Mac OS, they break your machine when you try to record audio. <laughs> Lido.com slash coder. Go there to get $100 in credit on your new account. And of course, you support the show. It tells Linode, hey, thanks for making the Coder Radio program possible. Linode is the largest independent cloud computing provider. No matter what skill level you're at or what technology stack you prefer to use, they're going to help your ideas come to life on the web. And their boxes are screaming fast. A lot of times when people are trying them out for the first time and they send me feedback, that's number one. It's faster than I expected. Linode really knows what they're doing. They've built out a network of 11 data centers. They are their own ISP. They've done super fast native SSDs for each hypervisor, 40 gigabit connections coming into the machines. And then they wrap it all up with a beautiful, simple dashboard that doesn't get in your way, but lets you get access to the power features where it makes sense. I mean, you can even do your own custom images on Linode. So if you've got a stack that you want to build and then just deploy that image, they're going to accommodate that. They have S3 compatible object storage. And I point this out because you can do really economical front-end Linodes that are using the S3 object storage as their back-end file storage, and you don't have to sit there and worry about allocating the right storage to that Linode. It all just works. And then, of course, anything that's S3 compatible, you can use there. That includes even just mounting file systems. Linode also features things like cloud firewalls, so you can protect your machines at the network level and prevent that traffic from banging on your door. And then when you just want to get started quick, Linode has those one-click application deployments. I did that recently just for a quick Docker stack as a way to just get an application up and running and test it. I'm really grateful for that kind of stuff because if you're working with that tooling, you get a Linode deployed, you know, in like, I don't know, 25 seconds. It's just really just so quick. And then, and I, the way I do it with my Linode 2s, I already have my SSH keys uploaded. 
So uh, when I'm deploying a new Linode, I just check my the boxes. Yep. Yeah, attach my SSH keys to that Linode. And so they spin it up and I just SSH into it and I'm 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 in. It's it's so so great. And then the Docker stuff was already installed with this particular one click that I did. So it was just a matter of putting together a Docker compose file and turning the application on and I was off and running. So so quick, so easy and then it's really fast. And I picked the Texas data center so that would be right in the middle of everybody that'd be working on the box. So go get that $100 credit so you can really see what I'm talking about here. It's just a lot to take in. And so I think $100 really lets you soak it all up, gives you an opportunity to learn, see what they do for themselves. So that's why you got to go check it out by going to linode.com slash coder. Get $100 in credit on your new Linode account and try them out. Linode.com slash coder. What a week. New York Times ran a hit piece on Google's CEO saying that he has paralyzing indecision that locks Google up and they got a bunch of VPs to go uh, off the record and on the record to just crap all over him. Uh, One Google executive who departed in February said, if I had to summarize it, I would say the signal to noise ratio is what wore me down. Since 2020, 36 Google vice presidents have left the company and some of them are getting vocal about why innovation challenges, uh, they are way too risk averse. Um, so several Google executives told the New York Times that the company is suffering from all kinds of issues that are related to their size now, including this paralyzing bureaucracy that seems to really kind of slow down at the top and a bias, they say, towards inaction and a fixation by the leadership on the public perception of the company. Mm. Uh-huh. And they say Sundar Pichai has to go. I don't really know that many regular people who aren't like super duper tech nerds really ever one had the love affair with Google that I think particularly folks like the open source community definitely did. So like when I, when I talk to regular people, you know, the normies, if there's a tech company that they hate, it's almost always Facebook. (laughs) Yes. Right. And they're like happy to not spend as much money as they would on an iPhone on a mid range Samsung. Yeah. Yeah. They're proud of their, which of course. Yep. Right. I mean, when I talk to tech people, I guess, like, you know, the other developers I know, it's weird because, like, I kind of always had a little bit of ire towards Google, but that was me banging my people should pay for software drum. Right. They're dumping on the market. Right. But I don't think that's what this is about. I don't know, right? There was the whole Google tried to get a government, the military contract thing, and didn't they have, like, a worker strike or something? Yeah, they had, they had some, they had a walk, they had a big walkout. Yeah. It doesn't read like the typical Google criticism. What this reads to me as is a bunch of hotshot VPs who had the next brilliant product idea to take on company X, pitched it, Google didn't act on it, and then company X came to market. Uh, Like The story that I saw bubble up in the Google ecosphere before this one is that Google internally has been working on an AirTags competitor. And... There's people internally that are salty that they didn't get it out before Apple got AirTags out. And now they feel like they're going to look like a Me Too brand when they when they release their tracker. And I think that might have been maybe the impetus for somebody to reach out to The New York Times or completely alternatively, this entire thing is a brilliant PR piece by a firm that is really earning their dollar right now, because my read on this is good. I think this is great news. The fact that Sundar Pichai takes a while to make a decision as a leader at Google. Thank God. Thank God. And the other part this story touches on is that people are salty. They didn't buy Shopify. Good. I'm glad Google didn't buy Shopify. Like when you look at this from a market strategy standpoint right now, there's a lot of heat coming down from different governments about antitrust. So maybe having somebody at the helm of the world's most scary data collector that is cautious and thinking and thinking about things and taking his time to make a decision. Maybe that's a good thing. When I read this, I think that's exactly what I want Google CEO doing is thinking long and hard about the decisions and industry moves that they make. <laughs> you know, I think this in a way is almost like a PR piece for Google to twist the way the regulators are going to look at Google. I'm not saying that's what it is, but it's such it's so good for that that it, could, it almost could be. I love it. So you think there's some VP like kvetching to the New York Times being like, damn, this Sundar guy, he's not being as rapacious a capitalist as I would. Well, 
I mean, yeah, I think I think it's in a way I'm glad. Um, I, I agree that for Google, maybe it would be better if he was being a little more ruthless. They probably should have snapped up Shopify. Um, they could be a little more dynamic. They could be a little more aggressive and they would probably be doing even better. But but dude, Alphabet itself is worth like around one point six trillion dollars right now. So maybe it's. I mean, maybe they're not doing it wrong. You know, Wes in the chat room makes a good point. There is some rings of truth in there that Google does seem to lack focus, you know, that their decisions are slow. And then when they do make a decision, it's generally reactionary to the market. Those are all true. I mean, there's a connected story going on basically in all the press right now of um, all the big tech companies are fighting like hell to prevent this regulation. Yeah, when there's been like in the U.S., there's been like five different proposals on how they could break these big tech companies up for antitrust. The EU's got stuff in the works. They're all they're like the uh, they're getting surrounded. If you're any of these other tech CEOs, you just got to hate Zuckerberg the most because he really brought this down on them. Yeah, you're right. All right. Well, the Facebook election, without Cambridge Analytica, it, the politicians would not be. It seems weird to say, but not so long ago, the tech companies were like the great, you know, the great hope, right? The darlings. Right. America's best industry. Right. You know, this is the future. We're going to have all these new. And they remember biotech was going to be the next thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, autonomous automation was going to be like a good thing. Now you you say you do automation. You're like, oh, so you're trying to put my uncle out of a job. (laughs) Right. It's thing. The worm has turned and it's all because of Marky Mark. That is an interesting insight. I think you're right. That really was the beginning of this whole thing. And then when they when they hauled him in front of Congress, he's like, I welcome regulation. Of course, the big companies love regulation because it, it puts barriers up to the little guys. I'm not so sure Apple does. You know, did you see the story that Tim Cook called Nancy Pelosi? Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Also, it's not in the headline, but Google's senior vice president for global affairs, Kent Walker, also has made many calls to lawmakers in recent days, too. They're essentially trying to push back. Uh, But I guess the reception has been cold. Supposedly, Pelosi told Cook that uh, she needs specifics on what doesn't work for him. And Cook says these changes would disrupt iPhones in the market and actually cause like grief in people's life if you make these changes. And it's so crazy, man, because basically from the start of this show, you and I have been saying this is the way this is going to go. This is the way this is going to go from day one. And now here we are. And I think they're going to it up. And Apple is totally unprepared. You know, they're not making the concessions they need to make. If Apple would have given up on their 30% cut years ago, they'd be in a way better position. But they antagonized developers to the point where they became outraged. And they're trying to claim that forcing them to open up third-party installs on the iPhone would just completely wreck the iPhone of all security, which is complete and total bullshit. Because, of course, you'd still have to have a developer account. You'd still have to have an entitlement that is signed by Apple. They would retain the ability to revoke those apps and entitlements. They could revoke your developer account, even if you didn't go through the App Store. Just like they can do now on on their platform. They could do it to third-party apps that get sideloaded. They still could have to require signing. The whole thing is such bull from Apple. And it's like they don't think, it's like they don't appreciate the train that is coming their way. Because what makes Apple work is the integration of everything. Like if you took one message away from WWDC, it was that all of those features are coming to all of the platforms at once. iOS, the Mac, the iPad, they're all getting all of the features at once and they work together with things like universal control. That's what makes Apple's ecosystem compelling. The fact that the AirPods work so well with the damn phone. And so if regulation comes in and breaks all this up, they're going to be so screwed because their secret sauce is taken from them. And so they are they are playing with a kind of fire that could destroy them. And it's wild to watch a company go from nearly dead to now so far up that they're being they're going to be sliced up by the government. Mm, I mean, are they going to be sliced up or are they going to just have to like take less than 30 percent? I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, Apple has been building a legal team for a while. I don't think anybody is getting broke. The only one I think might face an actual breakup is for some reason, the Instagram thing seems to have pissed off the lawmakers significantly. Hmm. And I feel like Facebook could lose either Instagram or what is it? WeChat that they own or is it? Yeah. WeChat, right? Yeah. That I could see only because like Apple is doing hardware integration and software integration between their family of products. 
Microsoft bundling Internet Explorer. I mean, that might be how they're looking at this. Okay, but let's take me, right? Like one of the reasons I keep floating back to Mac is like as I buy, Chris was right, the HomePods are great. <laughs> um, or like the AirPods Max, right? These are I'm using them right now for, for my audio output, right? I'm using the fancy mic for the input. These are really nice. They automatically know which device I'm trying to use. I don't have to do, you know, the Bluetooth dance that I used to always have to do, or I don't have to get cables that are going to get frayed and then only come out of one ear like my other headphones. I can, you know, quote, throw, what is it, AirPlay? Stuff from my computer to my phone to the HomePod to the HomePod in another room Mm -hmm. and seamlessly pick it up. I don't think that's antitrust. I don't think that's really being a trust. Now, Apple saying that who can and cannot have software in the App Store isn't either, to be honest, except when they say, users may only get software via the app store, right? So so I guess I argued myself actually into your position that the problem to me that Apple has is if I want to, you know, if the mad botter wants to make the the next great iPad app and Apple for some reason doesn't like it, then I'm hosed. Yeah. I can't go to you know, Tim Sweeney at Epic and say, I want to put it in your store, right? (laughs) This is where the whole store analogy kind of falls down because if, you know, if 7-Eleven doesn't want to carry my, my slushy brand, well, quick check might or Wawa might. That's not the case on iOS. I just can't imagine regulators stop at the app store. Like they open, once they crack that door open. Yeah, but where else are you going to go? You could say maybe AirPods need to be broken out or something. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. So no, it's not. The reason why I think is I think there is an appetite in the U.S. public. Uh, So there was a survey done today, and 53% of the citizens of the states that were surveyed, 53% somewhat support Congress's big tech antitrust bills, 44% rank rank tech regulation as a low priority or the lowest. I think 53% is a pretty significant number, and the reason why I think it's significant is the poll was actually commissioned by a tech industry-funded group, so if anything, it's going to, like... Those, it's going to bring those numbers down because it's depressing the numbers. And if the numbers are 53% when they're depressed, I'm a little concerned about that. However, the survey showed that when you were given specific examples of how they might break up the big tech companies, respondents said they would then oppose them. But initially, the concept of breaking up big tech so that way it's fair for consumers and small businesses, people like that idea. And so it gives our Congress critters an opportunity to go up there and sound like they're doing something for the people. And, you know, play, play tough without actually having to do anything that really is going to change the lives of, of the American people. Like there's so many other things they should be focusing on right now, even with all the crap we talk about this. But this is what they're going to focus on. Honestly, if they can get on the other end of this and what we all what's really changed is we get more access to installing apps on our devices. Great. I think the, where my primary concern comes from is watching what they did to Microsoft and how they neutered them, how Microsoft went and just kind of just became an old slow dog after the antitrust stuff came in for better or for worse i suppose i i guess i just i can't get past the idea that they're just going to go for the easy win and say instagram can't be part of facebook yeah oh and by real real time follow up uh recently chat points out it's whatsapp we chats the china chat app and it's oh WhatsApp WhatsApp. Is okay. Okay. yeah we'll see i suppose um this boy this this stuff is really rolling on though it really is coming up it's coming up and uh I think I think they're not playing a smart game here. I think the tech companies are about to get rolled by DC and that when you look at other industries like the defense and oils and other big industries like pharma, they know how to handle this so much better than these tech companies do. They suck at this kind of stuff. I mean, the fact that the that Tim Cook called Nancy Pelosi and that leaked out is an example of something that just doesn't happen with the other big companies. Well, and she obviously leaked it, right? So, <laughs> yep. Playing hardball. Playing hardball. Like, Good luck, Tim. Datadog.com slash Coder Radio. Take a look at your code level performance across your entire environment with beautiful dashboards and troubleshoot issues faster with Datadog. Datadog has a continuous profiler that automatically collects the profiles from your production servers all the time, capturing it in its little capsules so that way you can analyze it anytime you want and get access to it quickly with minimal overhead. You can get a unified picture of your environment. You can correlate your code performance with your server performance, with your network performance, all in real-time dashboards 
gorgeous. Go to datadog.com slash coder radio for a limited time. If you start a trial and create one dashboard, you'll get a free t-shirt and you can see just how freaking gorgeous these dashboards are. They've done an incredible job. And I underscore that because that can really make a difference when you're in a discussion, a meeting, maybe with somebody that's upstairs, you can show them this information and they can grok it. And Datadog has over 450 integrations with different enterprise applications, giving you tracing and log management and that continuous profiler all in one platform. So Datadog enables you to pinpoint the root cause of issues faster than ever. So go try them out. Go to datadog.com slash coder radio. Get that 14 day free trial, create that dashboard and get a t-shirt. Boom, 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 boom. All while you're supporting the show. Datadog.com slash coder radio. Well, speaking of Microsoft, they're doing all right now. They just hit the $2 trillion milestone. Unbelievable. Boom. Their shares have gained 19% so far this year. Only Apple and Saudi's Armco or Aramco have hit the $2 trillion in value, which is an, you know, an oil organization. So Apple and an oil group have hit $2 trillion, and now Microsoft. $2 trillion. So I guess maybe, that, maybe they did okay after all that antitrust stuff. That's huge. Mm, that's sweet, sweet Azure money. Nadella is just, I mean, he's basically locked himself in the Hall of Fame of CEOs now. If, you, if you're if you CEO, why your company creates, you know, it's kind of a milestone like this, like he's set. Even if, even if he does nothing else remarkable for the rest of his tenure. Yeah, he's done. He's good. Yep. And, um, you know, congratulations to our friends at Microsoft. I don't know how much this really matters to the employees there. Not even a little. Boy, is it. Is it happening in the shadow of Bill Gates just eating a lot of shit these days? Oh, poor Bill. I know. Today, Warren Buffett announced he's uh, he's leaving the board of the Gates Foundation. It's um, it's like a, it's like there's a hit against Bill Gates, like a public PR hit. I, Honestly, I really think there was. He was like the last like loved tech tech guy. I mean, it sounds like there was some hanky panky. Yeah, and you don't think Warren Buffett did any hanky panky? That's why I find all the Bill Gates stuff kind of like. Mm. Yeah, I suppose. They're all kind of weirdos. <laughs> They're all kind of weirdos. Well, you, you don't get that rich and that much power if you don't have like a sense of entitlement that you just like do weird stuff. It's true. All the things are mine. Yeah. Well, so uh, it's all in the shadow of Microsoft becoming huge, but Gates is sort of just an after story now, I suppose, about it. I don't know. I wonder what's going on there. I wonder where that leads to. You think the goal is to just discredit people in tech in general, like big tech leaders? Because Bezos gets a lot of shit, too, although I'm not a big fan of either one of these guys. Um, I, I think that there's just a cultural moment right now where the tech guys are no longer, you know, seen as the lovable nerds who are going to build great things. That are going to save us all. Right, right, right. Hey, you know what I didn't realize when we started the show today? Tomorrow is the big Windows 11 reveal. I think you mean Windows 10X. <laughs> now, the art, I think you mean the artist formerly known as Windows 10X. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, is this Metro again? Kind of is. Oh, it's a deep cut. I actually think it's Plasma, dude. Have you looked at these screenshots? I just put a link to The Verge in there. It looks very KDE. It does It does have the essence of KDE going on, yeah. Isn't that, it's like GNOME and KDE had a baby and it's Windows 11 UI and a Chromebook with the, they, they made, I do not like the icons in the middle of the taskbar. That sucks. No, I don't, I don't like, I don't like anything about this. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, significant updates, Nadella says. Windows 11 will be uh, likely demoed tomorrow. There's already a leaked version online, so we kind of already know a lot. It sort of took a lot of the uh, excitement <laughs> out of the event. Paul Thorat's already gone over it in detail. Yeah, what does he think? Does he have a, do you have a quick summary of what Paul thinks? Thinks it's Windows 10X. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Because it, it is, right? Like Microsoft also recently announced their 30% cut on PC games is going down. They're dropping it to a 12% cut for uh, games. Ooh. Yep. That's that's eighteen percent of throwing the finger at Apple. <laughs> that's they're expecting Windows Eleven to be a free upgrade for any PC running Windows Ten right now. That's because it's Ten X. I think so. They say this is going to be the Windows release that focuses on Windows enthusiasts. Are there Windows enthusiasts? Is that a thing? I was unaware of such a creature. I I mean, not even Paul Thorat. Who makes his living writing about Windows? I would not even describe him <laughs> as a Windows enthusiast. You know, if you listen to his podcast, Windows Weekly, I would not categorize him as enthousi enthusiastic or even, you know, happy at all. <laughs> right. I, yeah. I, you know, I think it's what happens to guys who cover this for a while. Like, look at us. <laughs> <We're just> it's true. 
<laughs> oh man, it's just it's impossible to stay positive after you watch this. Listen, just take like a decade or so on on an OS, and you will hate everything about it. That's true. Any tool you use extensively, you become aware of all of its problems, and then uh, you know you kind of fixate on that for a bit. So meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. Just want to mention that one more time. If you're out in the Denver or Salt Lake City area in August and want to come roast with us, I imagine it's going to be real hot, right? In Salt Lake City, it's going to be real hot in on August 7th. Yeah, I would think so. Why am I doing this to myself? Why didn't I go up to Canada? Oh, the border's closed. That's right. Because you miss events. I do. That's what it is. I just decided to do my own thing. I, I'll be honest. I, I'm tempted. If I can somehow get away, I might do it. Oh, how fun would that be? Do you miss the events at all? I mean, like... I don't miss the bad, lame events. Yeah. But I think I think once we get out of this weird state, which will be, you know, 2022 in terms of, like, no conferences and stuff, I'll probably still... Like, there's a couple that are good. Like, Dev Fest Florida, I always enjoyed. Mm. I never went to Southeast Linux Fest, and no, no offense to anybody who runs it, but I've heard mixed things. Maybe at a good year, maybe at a bad year. But Linux Fest Northwest, I regret not going to. Yeah, I miss that the most. That's the one I miss the most. Yeah. It really was. I wouldn't go to WWC at this juncture because I don't do enough iOS stuff to care. Um, and Google I.O. is just a train wreck. So. <laughs> yeah. And those may stay virtual. Who knows? We'll see. I hope WWC actually stays virtual because it's just better. Well, I wonder if by the next time we get together on our regular Monday uh, recording, I wonder if you'll have a Thaleo. It might be too soon still, depending on parts and stuff. Probably not if it hasn't shipped, right? Yeah, it's two business days from pickup. So even if they would have to have it done tomorrow. Yeah, it's a long shot. Then I still wouldn't get it because it'd be Friday, Monday. Yeah, And on Monday, uh, my buddy Alex from Self Hosted, my co-host from Self Hosted, will be in studio. Um, so I might invite him to sit down with us if you're open to that. Sounds fun. He's going to be staying for the week and we're going to be just hanging out and working on projects. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've been kind of getting the studio prepped for him because prepared yeah you know it's just sort of when i'm just working here it's just a space for me really and um wes but uh we have a room that he can stay in and stuff so it's just getting that ready getting new linens and stuff like that the weird like ancillary things you do to support the business that have nothing to do with like creating content yep just totally like we're out there getting rooms ready and stuff, but it's, so, I'm totally looking forward to it. So that'll be fun. And I'm like, that'll, uh, that's going to spice things up for next week. So there you go. And, and maybe we'll have comments on the, uh, when I was tempted to try it windows 11, I may give it a download and try it out before next week's coder. I might. Oh, I'm going to try it out. Are you? Yeah. I'm going to try it out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Why not? I'll give it a go too. Well, uh, anything you want to mention before we get out of here? Yeah. Just subscribe to Coder radio. There you go. There you go. That's good too. Uh, you can follow the show on Twitter at Coder Radio Show. If you'd like to become a member, CoderQA.co, support the show, get a limited ad feed, and get our Coderly reports. Links to what we talked about today at Coder.show slash 419. That's where you'll also find our contact form, uh, our subscribe links for your podcast catcher of choice, our back catalog, all of that. And then we record the show typically on Mondays, except for this week, uh, at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern at jblive.tv. Another way you can find out is if you just follow or subscribe on twitch whatever they call that twitch.tv slash jupiter broadcasting then you get notified when we go live thanks so much for joining us on this week's episode of the coda radio program my voice held out now i can go shout and go celebrate and lose my voice thanks for joining us we'll see you right back here next week